Lecture number eight by Dr. Robert Vinoy on Kings. Dr. Robert Vinoy of Biblical Theological Seminary. Well, we finished Roman numeral one last week, which was the United Kingdom under Solomon, chapters one to eleven. So that brings us to Roman numeral two on the outlines I gave you, which is the divided kingdom before Jehu. The kingdom divided, as you know, in 931 B.C. The revolution of Jehu, where he wiped out the house of Ahab, is 841 B.C., so it's approximately a hundred-year period, 931 to 841 B.C., which we'll look at under this heading, Roman numeral number two. In capital A is the disruption, and number one under that is background. You read the section in 1 Kings as well as in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. But let me just mention by way of background that that disruption is not something that happened without any precedence. In other words, there were factors involved that led to that disruption that had been around for some time. If you go back into early Israel history in the land of Canaan, you remember the agreement that Joshua made with the Gibeonites that came to him representing themselves as from a foreign land. That's in Joshua chapter 9. Joshua concluded a treaty with them, which meant that the Israelites really could not carry out the command of the Lord to destroy these people because they had sworn in the name of the Lord that they would not do that. But that meant that right there in the heart of Canaan, you had these Gibeonites and the others that were permitted to remain as a foreign element in the land. You read in Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, The men of Israel sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live, and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath. So when they discover that they are really neighbors, that they're foreigners, that they're impostors, then we read in verse 18 of Joshua 9, the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. And verse 19 says, We have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel. We cannot touch them now. This is what we will do. We will let them live, so that the wrath will not roll on us for breaking the oath we have sworn to them. Now, those cities that are mentioned in verse 17 are Gibeon, Kephira, Beirut, and Kiryat Yerim, which form a line of cities that gives you a dividing line between the north and the south in the middle of the land of Canaan. Sometimes it's referred to as the Gibeonite Wedge, that is between the north and the south. But that was an alien, closely-knit group that resided in the center of the land that tended to divide the land into north and south. So that's one factor that may have tended to lean towards the division between north and south. Another factor may simply be the fact that there are two major tribes as far as territory and populations are concerned, and that was Judah to the south of Jerusalem and Ephraim to the north of Jerusalem. So again, you have a factor that would lean towards dividing north and south, the major tribe of Ephraim to the north, the major tribe of Judah to the south. Then also, there are previous tendencies that you come across in some of the narratives prior to this time. You remember, at the beginning of David's reign, he ruled initially in Hebron, just over the tribe of Judah. He ruled there for seven years over Judah, not all of Israel, but just over the tribe of Judah. At that time, Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, was ruling over the northern tribes. We find that in 2 Samuel chapter 2, the first few verses. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up into one of the towns of Judah? This is right after Saul's death. He asked, and the Lord says to him, Go up. Then David asked, Where should I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. David went up with his two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, and he settled in Hebron. And then we read in verse 4, The men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. You see, he's king over Judah only. In chapter 5 of 2 Samuel, you read in the first few verses, after Ishbosheth had been murdered, 
who in the meantime had been ruling over the northern tribes, we read in chapter 5, all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We're your own flesh and blood. In the past you were over us while you were the one who led Israel in their military campaigns. And the Lord said, You will shepherd my people Israel. You will become their ruler. Then the elders of Israel came to David at Hebron. The king made a compact with them at Hebron before the Lord had anointed David over all of Israel. He was thirty years old when he became king. He ruled seven years over Hebron and reigned over all Israel thirty-three years. So you see in verse 5 that clear distinction of David's rule over Judah at Hebron, seven years and six months, before he's recognized as king by the northern tribes. So there, too, you see the reflective tendencies towards the vision between the northern and the southern tribes. Another factor which really is prior to what we have just looked at as far as chronologies are concerned, during the time of David's exile, when he was being pursued by Saul, he fled for his life and he found a place of refuge among the Philistines. During that time, when he was in exile in Philistia, during the reign of Saul, he maintained a close relationship with the leaders of Judah. You find that in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 26, where we read, When David arrived in Ziklag, which is a Philistine town down south, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah who were his friends, saying, Here's a present for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. He sent it to those who were in Judah, and it lists a number of places in the towns of Judah as well to which he sent a tribute. So David cultivated a close relationship with the leadership of Judah and with the towns of Judah during that time, and then when Saul's dead, it's natural that Judah immediately claimed David as king, but the northern tribes did not. Now, Another possible factor I mentioned earlier back with our discussion of Solomon in chapter 4 of 1 Kings when we looked at those districts that had to provide support for Solomon's court. Remember, I mentioned at that time, it doesn't seem like there's any reference to the area of Judah in those 12 districts. So some feel that perhaps during Solomon's reign there was favoritism shown to Judah. And if that's the case, then you can again tend to find the vision. That was in 1 Kings chapter 4. Among those 12 districts, there's no mention of Judah either by name or by a description of the areas that had to provide support for Solomon's court. It doesn't seem that any of the districts coincide with the territory of Judah. So the conclusion that some have drawn, and it's just an inference, is that Judah was not required to provide this monthly support for Solomon. They were exempted, which would be favoritism towards Judah, which the tribe of David and Solomon are from. That may have been the reason that they were favoring their own tribe, if that is the case. So you can see how that would lead to division. But those are just some factors that are perhaps involved in the background as to what we find at this point in Israel's history, where you come to the disruption itself and the breaking of the kingdom into two parts, north and south. All right, number two on your sheet is Jeroboam rebels against Solomon at Solomon's death. This is 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 26 to 41. As you remember, Jeroboam, often termed Jeroboam, son of Nebat, or Jeroboam I, because there's another Jeroboam down the line, he was an official of Solomon's court who was put in charge of the labor force of Ephraim and Manasseh. If you look at verse 28, you read, Jeroboam was a man of standing, and when Solomon saw how well the young man did his work, he put him in charge of the whole labor force of the house of Joseph. The house of Joseph would be Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh were the two sons of Joseph who became the heads of the two tribes and the tribal territories of Ephraim and Manasseh to the north of Jerusalem. So Jeroboam, son of Nebat, was in charge of the labor force of those two tribes. He himself, by the way, was from the tribe of Ephraim. You see, in verse 26, he was one of Solomon's officials and an Ephraimite. His mother was a widow named Zeruah. 
Of course, Ephraim was the northern tribe, the counterpart to the major tribe of Judah in the south. He is the one Ahijah came to and told him that the Lord was going to take away the kingdom of David and give it to Jeroboam. Although the descendant of David would always have part of Israel, and that would be Judah, and part of Benjamin. But even prior to that, it seems like he had determined to instigate a revolt against Solomon. I say that on the basis of a phrase in verse 37, where you read, this is in the words of Ahijah when he says, As for you, I will take you, and you will rule over all your heart's desires. Sounds like Jeroboam already contemplated and wanted the kingdom. You will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel. Now, as you recall, this man, an Ephraimite, was in charge of forced labor, apparently already had a desire to rule, and he is confronted by Hijah the prophet and told in words and in symbol that indeed he would rule over the northern tribes. What I mean by that is this. Ahijah had this coat, and he tore it into twelve pieces, and he told Jeroboam to take ten pieces for himself. And then he says that that symbolism means the Lord is going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hands and give him, Jeroboam, ten tribes. That's verse 31. But he goes on and says, But for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes, he will have one tribe. So Jeroboam is encountered by Ahijah, who tells him both in word and symbol that the Lord is going to take ten tribes from Solomon and give them to him. But as Ahijah goes further, he makes it clear that it's not to happen in Solomon's days. In verses 34 to 35, he says, I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hands, and he will rule all the days of his life. For the sake of David my servant, whom I have chosen to observe my commands and statutes, I will take the kingdom from his son's hands and give you ten tribes. I will give one tribe to his son, so that David my servant may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem. So Ahijah tells Jeroboam he's going to get these ten tribes, but it's not going to happen in Solomon's days. It's going to happen in the days of his son. But apparently Jeroboam did not want to wait for the Lord's timing and wait for Solomon's death. And apparently he attempted to revolt even prior to Solomon's death. You read in verse 26, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, rebelled against the king. Then you read down in verse 40 that Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam fled to Egypt to Shishak, the king or the pharaoh, and he stayed there until Solomon's death. So if you put verse 26, where it says Jeroboam rebelled together with verse 40, where it says Solomon tried to kill him, it seems like Jeroboam prematurely tried to grasp the northern tribes for himself even before Solomon's death. Now, that sort of gives you an ominous sign, you might say, about what kind of rain you might expect to come from Jeroboam when he finally does come to the throne in the north. It seems that he's not willing here, even initially, to listen to the word of the prophet Ahijah, who told him that this is not going to happen in Solomon's days. He tried to take things into his own hands, however, but it appears that his failure then, successfully, to take the kingdom before Solomon's death resulted in a necessity for him to flee to Egypt, where he stayed until Solomon actually died. Now, the reason why God judged Solomon in this way, by taking ten of these tribes from his line, from his descendants, the reason is given earlier in the chapter that we looked at earlier this week, verses 9 to 13. And we read, So the Lord became angry with Solomon, because his heart turned away from the Lord. And then in verse 11, it says, and we read again, The Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my commandment and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, I will not, for the sake of David your father, do it during your lifetime. So you get the reason there, and also in verse 33 in the chapter that we're looking at tonight. There you read, I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Moloch, the god of the Ammonites, 
and have not walked in my ways, or have done what is right in my eyes, or have kept my statutes and laws, as David, Solomon's father, did. So those are the reasons he turned away from the covenant and went after false gods. Okay, that's number two. Jeroboam rebels against Solomon. And then at the end of 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 41, you read of Solomon's death. As for all the other events of Solomon's reign, all he did, the wisdom he displayed, are written in the book of the Annals of Solomon. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel forty years. Then he rested with his fathers, and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son succeeded him as king. So, that brings us to number three, Rehoboam's foolish attitude, and that's 1 Kings chapter 12, the next chapter. We read there at the end of chapter 11 that Rehoboam succeeds Solomon as king. It seems to be a normal succession. However, there's an interesting statement at verse 1 of chapter 12, where it says, Rehoboam went to Shechem, where all the Israelites had gone to make him king. That seems like that's a reference to the northern tribes. Remember, when David became king, initially he was king over Judah. Only later was he accepted and acclaimed king over the northern tribes. It seems like when this succession takes place here, that Rehoboam feels that it's necessary to go to Shechem to be ratified as king by the northern tribes. You read in the second verse that when Jeroboam, who had fled to Egypt, hears about this, he quickly returns to Egypt to be present. In that meeting, you find that the man is placed on Rehoboam to lighten the yoke that Solomon had put on the people of Israel. You read this in verse 4. The assembly says, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke you put on us, and we will serve you. And Rehoboam asked for some time to consider that request. He consults with some advisors who had advised his father Solomon, and they advised him to consent to that. But then they advise him to consult with some younger advisors. So you read in verse 10, The young men who had grown up with him replied, Tell these people who said to you, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make it lighter. Tell them, My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. End quote. In other words, not only were the tasks to be intensified, but the punishments as well. Notice where it says, My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. A scorpion is a leather strap filled with sharp protrusions of metal or stone, or something like that that would cut. The tasks are intensified, the punishments are intensified, and certainly these words betray a foolish attitude. Not only a foolish attitude, they are hardly the words of a true covenantal king, someone who has a concern and compassion for the people over whom he is placed as ruler. So the response of Israel is in verse 16. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel. Look after your own house, O David. So the Israelites say, We're not going to accept you as king. But Rehoboam is not ready to accept that response. So he sends out, in verse 18, a man named Adoniram. You read that King Rehoboam sent Adoniram, who was in charge of the forced labor. He had been in charge of that under Solomon, Rehoboam's father. But all Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam got in his chariot and escaped to Jerusalem. So Israel, we read, has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. That is, presumably, to the day in which the book of Second Kings is written. In other words, the kingdom at this point was divided, and it remained divided for the rest of its history. So the prophecy of First Kings, chapter 11, verse 39, is fulfilled. Ahijah said, speaking from the Lord, I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. So the prophecy is fulfilled, and Judah remains separate from Israel for the rest of Israel's history, until the time of the exile, when the northern kingdom is carried away to Assyria in 722 B.C. There's another thing that may be a factor there in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 16. 
The dividing line between Hebrew poetry and Hebrew prose is very fluid. The primary thing that is usually pointed to as characteristic of Hebrew poetry is that the poetry is set apart from prose by parallelism. And you see, you have here this parallelism. What share do we have in David? Then what part do we have in Jesse's son? So we get two parallel lines. And then again, to your tents, O Israel, followed by, look after your own house, O David. You see, you have double parallels in here. You find parallelism like that in prose as well. And that's an example of a forceful way to put things. That kind of repetitive rhetoric is characteristic of Semitic writing generally. And the point emphasized here is that there is a split in the kingdom. And that's what the parallelism emphasizes. All right, that was number three, Rehoboam's foolish attitude. Little a is the disruption, and little b is the first three kings of Judah, which are Rehoboam, Abijah, or Abijam, and Asa. So the first one is Rehoboam, and that's in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 42, to chapter 14, verse 31, and that's paralleled in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 31, to chapter 12, verse 16. Now, I have two subpoints there, also in your outline. And little a is Rehoboam's attempt to reconquer Israel, and that's 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 21 to 24. And B is relations with Egypt. Let's look at Rehoboam's attempt to reconquer Israel, 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 21 to 24. The end of that chapter, not all the way to the end, but the beginning there in verse 21, you read that Rehoboam decides to raise an army to attempt to subdue the northern tribes forcefully in order to restore unity to the kingdom. However, he's confronted by a prophet. The word of the Lord comes to Shemaiah this time, who then goes to Rehoboam and tells him not to do that. Do not try to reconquer the north. You read that there in verse 24. This is what the Lord says. Do not go up against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again as the Lord had ordered. So on that matter, Rehoboam submits to the word of the Lord, to the word of the prophet. He drops his plans and the division remains. And then little b is his relations with Egypt. This skips forward to chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 25 to 28. What happens here is that the writer of Kings shifts at that point in chapter 12 to what's going on in the north with Jeroboam and his setting up of the golden calves and so forth, and he doesn't come back to Rehoboam until chapter 14, verse 21 and following. But you read there in the 25th verse of 1 Kings 14 that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. He plundered the temple and the royal palace. You read he took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made, so Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them. Now, this reference is interesting because it's one of the incidents in the kingdom period that is corroborated with extra-biblical evidence. And, in fact, we learn from Egyptian records that when Shishak attacked Jerusalem, that was really part of a larger campaign. It wasn't that he just came up out of Egypt to attack Jerusalem only. That's the only thing that the biblical references tell us about, because that's what they're interested in, what is happening in Israel. But a victory inscription of that campaign was found in the walls of a temple in Thebes. In that inscription, Shishak lists numerous cities that he plundered. This is interesting. They were cities not just in Judah, but also in the northern kingdom. And that's rather striking, because you remember that Jeroboam, who now was king in the northern kingdom, when he had prematurely tried to revolt against Solomon and had been unsuccessful, he fled to Egypt and had refuge with Shishak. That would make you think that Jeroboam and Shishak would be good buddies. But that didn't seem to make much difference at this point, because Shishak undertakes his campaign up into the land of Canaan. In fact, it's not only Jerusalem that gets attacked, but cities in the northern kingdom do 
as well. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with these two volumes that I'm holding. These are two standard volumes of ancient and Near Eastern texts. This is the English translation of texts from Egypt, from Mesopotamia, and the Hittites, generally from the ancient Near East. These texts have been translated and published together. The texts were edited by James Pritchard, and the volumes are called Ancient Near Eastern Texts Relating to the Old Testament. And it's abbreviated, capital A, capital N, capital E, capital T, or as we affectionately call it, Anit. There's a companion volume as well called Ancient Near Eastern Pictures Relating to the Old Testament. In many cases, the texts that are translated in the first volume have a picture of them in the second volume. Now, the text of that victory by Shishak that I discussed is on page 263 in this Anit, Ancient Near Eastern Text Relating to the Old Testament. And in Ancient Near Eastern Pictures, we find the picture of it on page 349. I'll show you this and pass it around. I think it's interesting to see this. Picture 349 on page 128, that's on the bottom here, you can see the picture there of Shishak and then inscriptions all surrounding it. Note the listener. You can probably go online and find this now. It says here, list of Palestinian and Syrian cities captured by Shishonk, which is the same name as Shishak. Shishonk and Shishak are the same. The reason for the different spelling is there are different ideas of how Egyptian hieroglyphics are to be pronounced. So let me just pass this around. Then there's another piece of evidence that's been found, and that is a fragment of a monument that was found near Megiddo, a city in northern Israel, in the Jezreel Valley. And that bears the name of Shishak. Most feel this probably means that he had set up some sort of monument at Megiddo at the time of his campaign, as sort of a victory monument to put his name on it. A piece of that with his name on it has been found. And again, you can check Anit, page 264, although we don't have a picture of it. So that's the attack of Shishak mentioned there in Kings. There's a fuller description of the attack and the reasons for it in Second Chronicles chapter 12, which is a parallel passage. If you look at Second Chronicles chapter 12, verse 5, you read there that Shemaiah, same prophet who had told Rehoboam not to go back and attack the north, in Second Chronicles chapter 12, verse 5, it says, The prophet Shemaiah came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah, who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak. He said to them, This is what the Lord says, You have abandoned me, therefore now I abandon you to Shishak. The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is just. When the Lord saw they had humbled themselves, this word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. Since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but will soon give them deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem through Shishak. They will, however, become subject to him, so that they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of other lands." When Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem, he carried off the treasure of the temple. End quote. I think it's clear that the attack came because Rehoboam and Judah had turned away from the Lord. They had turned away from their covenantal responsibilities. But when they repented and confessed that the Lord is just, the Lord ameliorated the situation so that, even though they were plundered, they were not utterly destroyed. Okay, that's Rehoboam and his attempt to reconquer Israel and his relations with Egypt. Second, his son, Abijah, or also called Abijam, or Abiyam, if you want the Hebrew, his name appears in both forms. 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 31, to chapter 15, verse 8, and is paralleled in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verses 1 to 22. Abijah had a short reign, just three years. You read in chapter 14, verse 31, that Rehoboam rested with his fathers. That's a characteristic way of saying he died. He was buried with them in the city of David. His mother's name was Naamah, she was an Ammonite, and Abijah, his son, succeeded him as king. Then you read in chapter 15, verse 1, 
In the eighteenth year of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, Abijah became king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem for three years. His mother's name was Maacah, daughter of Abishalom. He committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his forefather had been. Now, it appears that he was a complex personality with respect to that question of loyalty to the Lord. First King chapter 15, verse 3 says that his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, yet for David's sake the Lord spared him. But in Second Chronicles chapter 13, verses 15 to 18, we get another side of the picture. There it says, And the men of Judah raised the battle cry. At the sound of the battle cry, God routed Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. The Israelites fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hands. Abijah and his men inflicted heavy losses on them, so that there were 500,000 casualties among Israel's able men. The men of Israel were subdued on that occasion. The men of Judah were victorious because they relied on the Lord, the God of their fathers. Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took from him the towns of Bethel, Jeshana, and Ephron with their surrounding villages. Jeroboam did not regain power during the time of Abijah. So in Second Chronicles we read that because Judah relied on the Lord, they were victorious over the attack by Jeroboam from the north. So we see Abijah's life must have displayed a mixture of belief and unbelief. But it was certainly by God's mercy that Jerusalem was not destroyed, either by Shishak or by this attack from the north. But the indication is that Abijah's heart was not perfect towards the Lord, as it should have been. As King says in verse 3, his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God. Kings does not give a great deal of treatment of Abijah, and his reign was brief. Let's go on to Asa, who is the third ruler of Judah. And that's in 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 8 to 24, and in 2 Chronicles chapters 14 to 16. Now Asa was a major king. He ruled 41 years. He had a long reign. We see that in 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 9. The twentieth year of Jeroboam, Asa became king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem forty-one years. That's longer than either Saul, David, or Solomon. The length of Saul's reign is somewhat obscure. There's a textual corruption in the verse that describes the length of his reign. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, I believe, it says Saul was thirty years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel. Now, the NIV says forty-two years. But that 40 was an insertion, as was the 30. In the text, there's an insertion there. See that the NIV text notes say the Hebrew does not have 40. So it's somewhat obscure exactly how long Saul reigned. It seems to me there's a reference in the book of Acts to the length of Saul's reign. I'm not sure I can find it. It might be Acts 13.21. Yes. And we read, Then the people asked for a king, so he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled forty years. End quote. But you see, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1 in the Hebrew text, Saul was one year old when he became king, and he reigned two years. Acts 13 says he reigned forty years. If you read it the way the NIV has it, he didn't reign forty years, he reigned forty-two years. That 40 could be a round number as compared to the more exact 42. But the thing is, the text in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, that speaks of the reign of Saul and his age when he began the reign, is corrupted. Something has happened to it. There's obviously a textual problem here. In any case, if he reigned 42 years, then what I just said about Asa isn't true. I said that Asa reigned longer than Saul, David, or Solomon. He reigned 41 years, David reigned 40 years, and Solomon reigned 40 years. We read that of David in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 10. David rested with his fathers, was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years over Israel, 7 years in Hebron, 33 in Jerusalem. In Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 42, it says, Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel for 40 years. So Asa reigned 41 years. 
He's described as a good king whose heart was right. 1 Kings Chapter 15, verse 1, however, there is a qualification. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. He expelled the main shrine prostitutes from the land, got rid of the idols his father had made, even deposed his grandmother Maka from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive Asherah pole. Asa cut that pole down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. But this qualification is in verse 14. Although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought into the temple of the Lord the silver and gold, the articles he and his father had dedicated. Now, that expression that someone's heart was not perfect towards the Lord, however, he didn't remove the high places or something similar to that, is something you find in a number of places in the book of Kings. So I think we ought to look at what these high places were and what the implications are. And this is a rather complex question. It's hard to know exactly how to explain what these things imply. But let's take a break, and we'll get to that next time. That's the end of lecture number eight by Dr. Robert Vinoy on Kings, Dr. Robert Vinoy of Biblical Theological Seminary.